time for another Snowball Reads. And, of course, since Snowball is reading A Dance in Fire, Snowball must read 6 and 7 before going on. Read. Go ahead, read it. A, A Dance in Fire, Chapter 6 by Raguin Jarth. Damascus Scotty sat down listening to Leod's Juris. The clerk could hardly believe how his, how fat his former colleague at Lord Atreus's building commission had become. The piquant aroma of the roasted meat dish before Scotty melted away. All the other sounds and textures of Prithala Hall vanished all around him as if nothing else existed but the vast form of Jarus. Scotty did not consider himself an emotional man, but he felt a tide flow over him at the sight and sound of the man whose badly written letters had been the guidepost that carried him from the Imperial City in early Frostfall. Where have you been? Jarus demanded again. I told you to meet me in Falnesity. Weeks ago. I was there weeks ago. Scotty stammered, too surprised to be in indignant. I got your note to meet you in Athe, and so I went there, but the Khajiit had burned it to the ground. Are you so bad mean to the Khajiits? Somehow I found my way with the refugees in another village, and someone there told me that you had been killed. And you believe that right away? Jarus sneered. The fellow seemed very well informed about you. He was a clerk from Lord Venetch's building commission named Regulus and he said that you had also suggested that he come down to Valenwood to profit from the war. Snowball thinks that always ends badly. Oh yes, wait a minute. Snowball's doing that. Snowball hopes it doesn't always end badly. Oh yes, said Jarus, after thinking a moment. I recall the name now. Well, it's good for business to have two representatives from Imperial Building Commissions here. We just need to all coordinate our bids and all should be well. Regulus is dead, said Scotty, but I have his contracts from Lord Venetch's commission. Even better, gasped Jars, impressed. I never knew you were such a ruthless competitor, Damascus Scotty. Yes, this could certainly improve our position with the Sylvanar. Have I introduced you to Bast Bast here? Scotty had only been dimly aware of the Bosmer's Bosmer's presence at the table with Jarus, which was surprising given that the Murr's girth nearly equaled his dining companion. Snowball thinks you should not make deals with very, very fat people. They might eat you. The clerk nodded to Bast coldly, still numb and confused. It had not left his mind that only an hour earlier Scotty had intended to petition the Sylvanar for safe passage through the, the border back to Cyrodiil. The thought of doing business with Jarus, after all of of profiting from Valenwood War with Elsewhere, and now the second one with Somerset Isle, seems like something happened to another person. Your colleague and I were talking about Sylvanar, said Bast, putting down the leg of mutton he had been gnawing on. Uh, he actually put it down? Wow. I don't suppose... You've heard about this, heard about his nature. A little, but nothing very specific. I got the impression that he's very important and very particular. 
He is the representative of people. Hold on. Snowball plugged in. He is the representative of the people legally, physically, and emotionally, explained Jarus, a little annoyed at his partner's lack of common knowledge. When they're healthy, so is he. When they're mostly female, so is he. Snowball is wondering about that. When they cry for food or trade for or an absence of foreign interference, he feels it too and makes laws accordingly. In a way, he's a despot, but he's the people's despot. Yay, the people. That sounds, said Scotty, searching for the appropriate word, like bunk. Uh, Snowball thinks it's more like bovine manure. Perhaps it is, shrugged Bath, Bast, but he has many rights as the voice of the people, including the granting of foreign building and trade contracts. It's not important whether you believe us, just think of Sylvanar as being like one of your mad emperors, like Pelagius. The problem facing us now that va the problem facing us now is that since Valinwood is being attacked on all sides, the Sylvanar's aspect is now one of distrust and fear of foreigners. This one hope of his people and thus of the Sylvanar himself is that the Emperor will intervene and stop the war. Will he? asked Scutty. You know as well as we do that the Emperor has not been himself lately. Jarus helped himself to Regulus's satchel and pulled out the blank contracts. Who knows what he'll choose to do or not do? That reality is not our concern. But these blessings from the late good Sir Regulus made our job much simpler. They discussed how they would represent themselves to the Sylvanar into the evening. Scotty ate continuously, but not nearly as much as Jarus and Bath. 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 When the sun had begun to rise in the hills, its light reddening through the crystal walls of the tavern, Jarus and Bath left to their rooms at the, at the palace, granted to them diplomatically in lieu of an actual immediate honor, uh, ah, audience with the Sylvanar. Scotty went to his room. He thought about staying up a little longer to ruminate over Jarus's plan and see what might be the flaw in them. But upon touching the cool soft bed, he immediately fell asleep. The next afternoon, Scotty awoke, feeling himself again. Uh, uh, uh. In other words, timid. For several weeks now, he had been a creature bent on mere survival. He had been driven to exhaustion, attacked by several jungle beasts, starved, nearly drowned, and forced into discussions of ancient Aldmeri poetical works. The Alt Murray? Ald Murray. Whatever. The discussions he had with Jarus and Bast about how to dupe the Sylvanar into signing their contracts seemed perfectly reasonable to them. Scotty dressed himself in his old battered clothes and went downstairs in search of food and a peaceful place to think. You're up, cried Bast. You're, see, you're seeing him. Wait. You're up, cried Bast upon seeing him. We should go to the palace now. Now, whined Scotty. Look at me. I need new clothes. This isn't the way one should dress to pay a call on, on a prostitute, let alone voice of the people of Valinwood. I haven't even bathed. You must cease from this moment forward. B. 
being a clerk and become a student of merchant of the of mercantile trade, said Leotis Jarus grandly, taking Scotty by the arm and leading him into the sunlit boulevard outside. The first rule is to recognize what you represent to the prospective client and what angle best suits you. You cannot dazzle him with opulent fashion and professional bearing, my dear boy, and it would be fatal if you attempted to. Trust me on this. Several others besides Basf and I are guests at the palace, and they have made the error of appearing too eager, too formal, too ready for business. They will never be granted audience with the Sylvanar, but we have re remained aloof ever since the initial rejection. I've dallied about the court, spread my knowledge of life in the Imperial City, had my ears pierced, attended promenades, eaten, drank, eaten and drunk. All of that was given to me. I dare say I've put on a pound or two. Snowball thinks a pound or forty. The message we've sent is clear. It is in his, not our, best interests to meet. You're mooching off of him to get him to see you sooner. Our plan worked at his best. When I told his minister that our imperial representative had arrived and that we were at last willing to meet with Sylvanar this morning, we were told to bring you there straight away. Aren't we late then, said Scotty? Very, laughed Jars. But that's, again, part of the angle. We're representing benevolent disinterest. Remember not to confuse the Sylvanar with conventional nobility. He, his is the mind of the common people. When you grasp that, you'll understand how to manipulate him. Jarus spent the last several minutes of the walk through the city expounding on his theories about what Valen would need it, how much, and at what price. They were staggering figures, far more, const far more construction and far higher costs than anything Scotty had ever been used to dealing with. He listened carefully. All around them, the city of Sylvanar reveled itself. Oh, revealed itself. Reveled itself, too. Glass and flower, roaring winds, and beautiful inertia. When they reached the palace of the Sylvanar, Damascus Scotty stopped, stunned. Jarus looked at him for a moment and then laughed. It's quite bizarre, isn't it? That it was. A frozen scarlet burst of twisted, uneven spires as if a rival sun rising. A blossom the size of a village where courtiers and servants resembled Nothing as much as insects walking about it, sucking its itchor. Entering over a bent petal like bridge, the three walked through the palace of unbalanced walls where the partitions bent close together and then t and touched. There was a shaded hall or a small chamber where they warped away from one another. There was a courtyard. There was no doors anywhere. No any way to get to the Sylvanar but by crossing through the entire spiral of the palace. Through meetings and bedrooms and dining halls, past dignitaries, consorts, musicians, many guards. It's an interesting place, said Bast, but not very much privacy. Of course, that suits the Sylvanar well. When they reached the inner corridors, two hours after they first entered the palace, guards brandishing blades and bows stopped them. We have an audience with the Sylvanar, said Jarus politely. This is Lord Damascus Scotty, the Imperial Representative. One of the guards 
disappear down the winding corridor and returned moments later with a tall, proud Bosmer clad in loose robe of patchwork leather. He was the Minister of Trade. The Sylvanar wished to speak with Lord Damascus Scotty alone. It was not the place to argue or show fear, so Scotty stepped forward, not even looking towards Jarus. And fast he was certain that they were showing their masks of benevolence, benevolent indifference. Following the master into the audience chamber, Scotty recited to himself all the facts and figures Jarus had presented to him. He wild himself to re he willed himself to remember the angle and the image he must project. Swindling. Audience chamber of the Sylvan Art was an enormous dome where the walls bent from bowl shape at the base inward to almost meet at the top. A thin ray of sunlight streamed through the fissure hundreds of feet above. And directly upon the Sylvan Art, who stood upon a puff of shimmering gray powder, for all the wonder of the city and the palace, the Sylvanar himself looked perfectly ordinary, an average, blandly handsome, slightly tired-looking, extraordinary wood elf of the type one might see in any capital in the Empire. Findle? It was only when he stepped from the dais that Scotty noticed an eccentricity in his appearance. He was very short. I had to speak with you alone, said Sylvanar in a voice common and unrefined. May I see your papers? Scotty handed him the blank contracts from Lord Vakanek's Vac building commission. As Sylvanar studied them, returning his finger over the embossed seal of the Emperor before handing him back. He suddenly seemed shy, looking to the floor. There are many charlatans at my court who wish to benefit from the wars. I thought you and your colleagues were among them, but these contracts are genuine. Yes, they are, said Scotty. Calmly, the Sylvanar's conventional aspect made it easy for Scotty to speak with no formal greeting, no deference exactly as Jarus had instructed. It seems mostly sensible to begin straight away talking about the roads which need to be rebuilt, and then the harbors that the Old Mary have destroyed. They're jerks to everyone, aren't they? And then I can give you my estimate on the cost of resupplying, renovating the trade routes. Why hasn't the Emperor seen fit to send a representative when the war with elsewhere began two years ago? asked the the Sylvanar glumly. Scotty thought a moment before replying of all the common Bosemary he had met in Valenwood. The greedy, frightened mercenaries who had escorted him from the border, the hard-drinking revelers, the expert pest exterminators, archers in the West Cross of Falnicity, noisy old Mother Pascot in the Havel Slump, Captain Balfax, the poor, sadly reformed pirate, the terrified but hope hopeful refugees of Athe and Grenos, the mad, murderous, self-devouring wild hunt of Vendissi. Snowball thinks they're werewolves. The silent doer boatman hired by Grolf Malin, the degenerate grasping Bast. If one creature represented their total disposition and that of many more throughout the province, what would be his personality? Scotty was a clerk by occupation and nature instinctively instinctively comfortable cataloging and filtering, making things fit into his system. If the soul of Valenward were to be filled, where would it be put? The answer came upon him almost before he posed himself the question. Denial. 
I'm afraid that question doesn't interest me, said Scotty. Now, can we get back to the business at hand? All afternoon, Scotty and the Sylvanar discussed the pressing needs of Valenwood. Every contract was filled and signed. So much was required that there was so many costs associated that the that addendums and codicil, codicils had to be scribbled onto the margins of the paper, and those had to be re resigned. Scotty maintained his benevolent indifference, but he found that dealing with a Sylvanar was not quite the same as dealing with a simple sullen child. The voice of the people knew certain practicality. Every everyday things were very well. The yields of fish, the benefits of trade, the condition of every township, and the forest in his province. We will have a bouquet of uh, Okay, we will have a banquet tomorrow night to celebrate this commission, said the Sylvanar at last. Best to make it tonight, replied Scotty. We should leave for Cyrodiil with the contracts tomorrow, so I'll need a safe passage to the border. We best not waste any more time. Agreed, said the Sylvanar, and called for his minister of trade to put his seal on the contracts and arrange for the feast. Quick, stamp these, stamp these now. I want to get them back before you find out what you signed. That's what Snowball thinks they're doing. Scotty left the chamber and was greeted by Bass. Snowball can't say that name. And Jarus, their faces showed the strain of maintaining the illusion of unconcern for too many hours. As soon as they were out of sight, of the guards, they begged Scotty to tell them all. When he showed them the contract, Bass began weeping with delight. Anything about the Sylvanar that surprised you, asked Jarus. I hadn't expected him to be half my height. Was he? Jarus looked mildly surprised. He must have shrunk since I tried to have an audience with him earlier. Maybe there is something to all that nonsense about him being affected by the plight of his people. It wouldn't be the weirdest thing Snowball's seen in this. Have a good day. Bye-bye.